with the ever-increasing demands. And they were ever-increasing. Leading by example, they acted as a pillar of strength through all the uncertainty. While others were furloughed and many couldn't work, Chabad continued working without a thought for the Can you hear me, guys? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, hi, everybody. Just for battling over there with the uh, screen share. But uh, welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining our, our Zoom webinar. And let me say as follows, that uh, as you've heard me say time and time again, the Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe had a dream. And the dream was that one day Mashiach will come. And when Mashiach will come, there'll be no more wars and no more sickness and no more suffering. No more sadness. There'll be a time where godliness is absolutely revealed in this world. In order to achieve this dream, the river sent emissaries throughout the world. And each country, each place has its particular challenges. England certainly has its challenges. The land of the prim and the proper. Rabbi Ben Sion Sudak's grandfather was sent by the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe in 1949 to England. His father became the first Chabad Shlech in 1959. Fast forward, today, Bensi, my good friend, is a real mover and shaker in London and in England. And what he accomplishes is amazing. And besides that, the, the amount of work that he does, but he's also a great speaker and a great teacher. So, Bensi, thank you for giving up your time and to share some of your wisdom with us. It's also great to have my good friend, Stephen Brada, a former South African who is certainly a pillar of the community here, now England has. And Steve, thank you for what you did for us when you were here. And you're going to be asking Bensi some questions when he finishes. But in the meantime, I want to pass over to Bensi, who's going to share with us a little bit about the history of Jews in England and bring us up to the present time and some of the challenges and some advice for how we should be dealing with what we're dealing with. Bensi, over to you. Thank you very much, Robert Macinto, and thank you, uh, Stephen. Uh, by the way, Robert Macinto, we don't use the term former South African because South African is a very biggest compliment you can give someone in, in England, because the South Africans who come here inject warmth and, and chayas into whichever community they touch. Probably a little, uh, uh, not just where they move to, but from South Africa itself. A lot of the South African community is a big inspiration to us from around the world. Um, so, and it's great to have Stephen as a local neighbor and a friend. So, um, I was asked a little bit to, to explain, first of all, to give context of a brief history of, of British Jewry. And there's some very interesting, some very interesting topics that happened um, that you could learn from the, Brit the story of Britain. People know a lot that we, you know, there was expulsions, etc. But I'm going to go through briefly and uh, pick out the small bits of, of Anglo-Jewish history that that talk to me. And uh, then we'll bring it down to today. And as Rabbi Masinta says, then we're going to bring it down to the real today of today, meaning Sunday, the 12th of July, what we do after we end the Zoom. So hopefully everyone will come away with a, something more, a little bit more informed, a little bit more educated, finding out some interesting things, but most importantly, inspired into action. As the Rebbe always said, Hamaisa Huaikar, the main purpose, the main point is the deed, is getting things done. And um, so here we go, without further ado, I'm just gonna bring up my screen here. And so, I'm not sure, can you see it? Is it coming through? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so first of all, the first, there was a lot of things that Britain exported to the world. Uh, big innovation, especially when it came with Jewish people. I'm not talking about good things either. So for example, the first history was in 1066, William the Conqueror invited a group of Jews from Royal France to settle here, mainly for financial reasons. Um, many countries there was the idea that people couldn't, um, the money lenders, so they would, would lend money only uh, the, the Catholics or the Christians, the other religions wouldn't lend money, but the Jews could. And this was 
and the Jews had connections with other Jewish communities around the world. And for governments in those days, it was quite common for them to bring Jews in for that reason. And, um, and uh, by 1168, just over 100 years later, they say 25% of British wealth was created by Jews. And they helped national initiatives, things like cathedrals and abbeys, and also the national war chest, which is why they were so important to the, um, to the government then. Now those cathedrals and abbeys also were used to defend Jews against mobs who were against, uh, you know, the, uh, blaming them for the other ills of society as it did. Now in 1190, in the lead up to Richard the Lionheart's third crusade, there was a big religious fervor against Jews. And uh, there were many different massacres and there was the infamous one in Clifford's Castle in York. And there, if anyone's been there, it's still there till today, it's on top of a hill. And there's where the Jews barricaded themselves and the mob outside gathered. It's a terribly sad story. The mob outside gathered and they gave the Jews inside a choice to convert or to die. And the Jews decided, chose not to convert and not to let them kill them either. And they, there was a suicide similar to Masada in, in Clifford's Castle in York. We also, the first, so the first, uh, this is a, didn't really last long, this, uh, uh, this settlement of Jewish people. It wasn't that great. We also exported the first blood libel, blaming Jews, uh, court, accusing Jews wrongly of putting blood in matzahs, which later became a, uh, a big theme hundreds of years later. It was invented in England in 1140, 1144. The first Jewish badge was initiated by the Archbishop of Canterbury in 1218. And finally, it culminates with the expulsion of the Jews because the uh, Edward I expelled them because of all the unrest that was happening. And it was such a anti-Semitic country by now. And for the income, he had other uh, sources, which is these Italian merchants who were called the, per the Pope's usurers, who would have like, I guess, a sanction to lend money. Now, for the next 300 years, there were no Jews in England. Now, in 1656, there was someone called Menashe ben Israel. Menashe ben Israel was from Amsterdam. Now, his family were what was called until today the Spanish and Portuguese community, because in 1492, the Jews were expelled from Spain and many <clears throat> all get all forced to convert. And there were those people who converted and kept. Their, their, their Jewish identity on the ground, and there was lots of persecution on that. Um, Jews made their way to Amsterdam. One of these was Menashe ben Israel, who also focused, uh, established the first Jewish printing press. Now he petitioned Oliver Cromwell and allow, uh, to allow the Jews to come in. Oliver Cromwell was leading Britain at the time after a, a, a revolution in England. And it, there were, after much decision, they decided to allow the Jews back. This is the first time Jews are there for 300 years. And um, the first thing they moved to, actually, there is a house not far from where I live, about 15 minute walk from where I live in Highgate. Not many people know this. In Highgate Village on top of a hill, there's a house. Uh, it's called Cromwell House, named after Oliver Cromwell, which belonged to Jewish families who built it in 1675 and in Highgate. And um, some people say this was a country home for the Jewish people and others say that at first Jews weren't allowed to live in the city of London and this was the closest they could live to the square mile or the city itself. And it's either in that house, in Cromwell House or in another house on Highgate Hill that there is a mikveh that was built then and is there till today, not used as a mikveh, but it's there. And they built a mikveh in the cellar and that was in Highgate. In 1701, they built the synagogue, Bevis Mark Synagogue is what you see on the right. Now this synagogue is magnificent. You can see this, these pictures are taken today, not today, today, but modern pictures, recent pictures. And as you can see, it's magnificent. You can see the, the date on top of the door. It's opened in 1701 and it has had uninterrupted minyonim from then. Services are taking place every day. In the picture at the top, you can see the chandeliers are actually candles. We'll go today. Uh, uh, where, uh, uh, for Yom Kippur, Kol Nidre, or for a special occasion or wedding, where they use these chandeliers, they are wax candles, the same chandeliers, the same seats as it's been all these years. It's a magnificent place. And it's one of the only synagogues, probably definitely the only synagogue in Europe that has had uninterrupted services 
since then. And sadly, this year was the first time that Bevis Mark Synagogue did not have services because of COVID. Now, <clears throat> uh, later on in 1753, they allowed Jews, that there was another revolution in England and the Jews defended London uh, um, against what was coming from Scotland. I'm not just gonna get all into it, but there was the Jewish people financed and physically fought to defend London. And in recognition of that, they passed a new bill. This bill was called the Jew Bill, and it doesn't sound too good. And this was to invite people, uh, Jewish people to become citizens. And this Jacobite uprising happened in 1745. Eight years later, they allowed the Jews to, uh, to become citizens. Moving on, now these, all of these Jews so far are mainly Spanish and Portuguese, which are known as the Sephardim. They came from Spain and Portugal. Now in the 1800s, things get better. You have famous people like the first Jewish knight, Moses Montefiore. Moses Montefiore is famous for his philanthropic things around the world. Um, uh, if you go to Israel, there's the famous windmill that he built in Jerusalem in an area called Yemin Moshe, which is named after his first name. And many other endowments and um, charitable things he did for Jews around the world. Um, there's many things, even the, the uh, cemetery in Queens, where the Rebbe, where the Rebbe's resting place is, which was built up or established after he, after Moses Montefiore passed away, but it's called the Montefiore Cemetery. Now, once there's a famous uh, story of his, but it's quite meaningful, Victoria asked Moses Montefiore, how much are you worth? And he said a certain figure, and she says, I know it's a lot more. So he says, yes, you didn't ask me how much I own. You asked me how much I was worth. Very big difference in what I possess and what I'm worth. If you're asking for what I'm worth, what my value is, the value is what I've given and what I have contributed, not what I have taken and what I own. That's not my value. That doesn't make me worth. What makes me worth is the amount of charity I've given. And I gave you the figure of the charity I gave this year. So he was knighted and people suggested maybe, you know, Moses Haim was a bit too Jewish, you know, change it to Maurice or something else. He says, no, I was born Moses. I will stay Moses. I will die Moses. His 100th birthday, he lived till 101, his 100th birthday was a national celebration. He passed away um, at 101 years old in 1875, and he was buried in his home, country home in Ramsgate, which had a, a uh, private synagogue, it was an estate. And in, actually in the 1970s, this was a Chabad retreat. Chabad kept the synagogue alive there. This is already a hundred years later. Today, there is something called the Montefiore Endowment in England, which uh, does many different charitable things, but it, it trains rabbis. And there are rabbis today getting smicha, getting dayanot, they still with the endowment from Moses Montefiore proving that his real value wasn't what he kept for himself, but that over a over hundred years later, rabbis are still being educated from his, from his tzedakah that was set up then. It just shows, gives us a little bit of perspective on what we value. So that's the 1800s. Again, um, now also at this time, there was um, Jews started getting into politics. The first was Moses Montefiore. Not so long later, there was the first hereditary peer, a member of the House of Lords. In England, you have the Houses of Parliament, which is the House of Commons, which are people elected by the common, by the common uh, folk, people, the electorate. And then there's the House of Lords, which is the upper house, who are appointed not elected and it's hereditary. So the position, or it was then at least, is given and it passes down to generations. The first Jew, Isaac Leon Goldsmith becomes one. 1855, the first Lord Mayor of London, Sir David Solomon, Salomon. In 1874, Britain gets its first Jewish prime minister, Benjamin Disraeli. Now, Benjamin Disraeli actually was, was kind of assimilated. He was more than kind of, he was baptized. But I think he told Queen Victoria that he is the blank page between the Old and the New Testament. He didn't completely see himself on either side. But one of the best quotes of Benjamin Disraeli was someone taunted him in Parliament. If anyone's watched British Parliament, it's very entertaining. It's always been like that. And he hit back saying, when the, when the ancestors of the right honorable gentlemen were brutal savages in an unknown island, mine were priests in the Temple of Solomon. Now that gives quite a bit of context to who our identity as Jews are. 
because however old, prim and proper England may be, the Jewish people are older and we, we were priests in the temple. We had the temple of Solomon, of kings of real royalty, all the way back then when England was an unknown island with brutal savages roaming it. Now, finally, in 1890, all restrictions were removed and Jews can have any profession except for being a monarch and 46,000 Jews now live in England. But then at the turn of the century is when things changed. The 20th century, the story of many Jewish communities around the world, probably in South Africa as well, many Ashkenazi Jewish communities. The pogroms in Eastern Europe caused Ashkenazi to flee. And by 1919, Anglo-Jewish population is 250,000. Now, during the 1930s, before the Second World War, England wasn't really open to Jews, but about 80,000 Jews settled in England, mainly from, I think, Germany and Italy, and about 10,000 children on a kinder transport, which was to, re to rescue children to come to England. And if you go to a Liverpool Street station, you will see a, a monument of children coming with their suitcases right in the middle of the station because that's what they came to. Now, this is where my family's uh, story starts in 1949 and the Chabad story. In 1949, um, my grandfather was someone called Ben Siyan Shemtov. He himself was, uh, was, they were in Soviet Russia and they escaped. My grandfather was a, under communist rule, when the communists came in, they saw that Judaism is under extreme threat in Russia. And there was a group of 10 people. First was the, uh, the sixth Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchok Schneerson, and he called nine students, who were uh, Bachram, students in the yeshiva. And he said, we have to do whatever it takes to preserve Jewish life in Russia. And whatever it takes means until our last drop of blood. Will we make a pact? And they did, they made a pact. And my grandfather was one of these people, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchok Schneerson later records that under him, he had 1500 students in these underground schools that they set up, underground schools, yeshivas, factories that enabled people to have a job while being closed on Shabbat. And finally, um, after they joined the war, they run to Uzbekistan as many Jews from Russia did who are living right near the, the front. And after the war, they escape Russia and uh, make their way through Europe. And finally, they to France. And there they were waiting whether to settle in France, go to America, go to Israel. And the sixth Lubavitcher Rebbe told my grandfather, Bansi Shemtev, to move to London. He moves to London and he gets a house in 89 Cranich Road in Stamford Hill. And behind his house, he opens what you see on the right. This is the first Chabad um, uh, a, uh, um, institution here, which is a Hebrew school for children from places around London where either the local Hebrew school or cheder had been closed or they had, and there was, at that time there was rations and it wasn't easy, food was rationed. You had a ration book and you got what you got. So cookies and, and snacks and biscuits and treats was, was something really that these children really um, meant a lot to them. And the chap on the right, all the way on the right actually contacted me a few years ago. Um, he's not involved with Chabad, but he fondly remembered from 1949 what those after-school programs were. And this is how Chabad started in the UK. Um, I know you had uh, Yudi Shemtov from America uh, speaking. That's his grandfather as well. Now, then Chabad moves on as, as 1959, the Rebbe appoints, and this is my maternal grandfather, the Rebbe appoints my father, Rabbi Nachman Sudak and sends him to live in England and to start as his first permanent shliach in the UK and to actually officially start the Chabad institutions and they set up what's called the Lubavitch Foundation and they build this building on the right, which is still up in Stamford Hill. It's called the Lubavitch House. And what's interesting about the name Lubavitch House is in the letter when they chose the name, uh, the Rebbe gives two names. He says, you should call the building either Lubavitch House, or if that isn't possible for some reason, call it Chabad House, which is possibly the first actual term of a building Chabad House. Now, this building was built. It, it has a school in it. It has a gym and it has a swimming pool, but there is no mikveh in that, in that, uh, 
in that building. And there's no official room that's a shul. So in those days to build a Jewish community center that doesn't have an actual sanctuary like a shul and doesn't have a mikvah, but it has a swimming pool was strange. Now the Rebbe told them to do this, this is a very interesting one. He said, because Jewish kids, Jewish children need a good Jewish environment to be in, which is healthy and a place where they can swim and a place where they can do exercises. So the big build, the big room, which is a gym you can convert and use as a shul on Shabbat. But if you build a shul there, you can't do exercises in there. And that room till today flips during the week. It's a massive auditorium stroke gym. And in the basement, there is a swimming pool. The Rebbe said there are other mikvaot in London. You don't need another one. But Jewish kids need a safe environment to go swimming. And that's what that building, that was um, almost a prototype of Chabad houses around the world that was built in the early 1960s. Then Chabad expanded around the country and Dar started a lot of its work on campus. And here is a picture of Chabad on campus event in the 1960s. On the left, you see Rabbi Zalman Posner. Uh, he was from Tennessee. Uh, giving a lecture, guest speaker. His grandson today is a shliach in Cape Town, uh, Rabbi Oshi Darren, Chabad of Table View, if anyone's familiar with him, that's his grandson. Um, and on the right, you have in this circle is, as a student, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. And this is from those days back then. And this is part of a, another one of the historic pictures of Anglo Jewry. Now, by this time, um, Anglo Jewry is growing. There are uh, different communities growing and institutions. And today, moving on, this is a map of Chabad in the UK today. Today, there are approximately across the UK, there are 60, establish 60 establishments, 20 or four of them in London, 15 on college campuses, and 129 Shluchim families. Um, across the approximately 350, in addition to that, uh, graduates of Chabad community in England are 350 of them are in uh, Shlichut positions around the world. So that gives you a little bit of an overview of the British community here. Um, uh, here is also some highlights of the of the um, of the different uh, here on the top left is, Ra is my father of Nachman Sudak getting an OBE from the Queen. Uh, next one is Rabbi Aryeh Safran um, receiving his MBE. Next to that is this past Hanukkah was Prince Charles made an event to recognize and appreciate the Jewish community in England. It was a special event and if you remember it was a long time ago in our minds but December this year was right before the elections and there were the atmosphere was quite tense here uh, while it was a close race between uh, Boris Johnson and Jeremy Corbyn. And um, right before Hanukkah, right then, uh, right before the elections, um, Prince Charles invites the Jewish community in an unpublicized event. And he spoke really fondly about the relationship and the warm place and the reciprocal relationship, he said, about how the Jewish, how the royal family pre know the sentiments of the Jewish people praying for them every Shabbat. And we feel them and reflect them back. It was actually a very, very warm, meaningful um, and sincere address. And what's happening here, actually, in this, in this picture, it was my birthday when I was introduced to them, to him. It was mentioned, so I told him a Hasidic, the Hasidic idea of a birthday, I, is, this is what I'm about to tell you, is that our Jewish view of the birthday is that your muzzle, your your, your luck shines on that day. And it's, you have the ability to bless others. So I gave him a blessing. And he says, normally the blessings flow the other way on birthdays. Normally the person whose birthday it is gets the blessings. I said, yes, but in Judaism, this is how it, how it, uh, how it means. He says, he took that as a, that's why he's showing very interest. He's asking why I was giving him the blessing. And um, the next, and then the next one is Boris Johnson visiting one of the Chabad centers in London. Next to that is Boris posing with Dreidelman, which is the uh, mascot of Hanukkah and Trafalgar Square, where every year uh, uh, Jewish community gather about um, five to 8,000 people, middle of Trafalgar Square, center of London, light a 30 foot menorah, there's a concert, 
And every year the mayor of London comes, and this is Boris posing with uh, Dreidel Man, the mascot. Following that is um, Nicola Sturgeon with Rabbi Pinny Weinman of Chabad of Edinburgh. And she's at the menorah lighting there two years ago. Um, so there we have it. It's a bit of, bit of an overview of Anglo Jewry. Uh, Stephen, if you want, uh, before I go on to my next topic, which is where we go from here and where we take COVID, would you like to stop for questions or shall we continue on? Thanks, Pensy. Maybe, maybe we can ask you um, just a quick question. When you, when you met with Boris Johnson, what mm -hmm. did you discuss and uh, what was his message to you? <clears throat> okay. Boris um, has met a few times with the Jewish community. Boris is a, uh, and one, he's a great orator. Um, each time, so many times he was really on the button. At that point, when we were talking there on the street, he came to see the community. He asked, actually was asking, he had a, in the poster that Rabbi Macinta sent out, you may see Rabbi Boris speaking about, uh, uh, holding a book of, about the Rebbe, you know, about Chabad. And um, he was actually asking me about the Rebbe, the idea of the Rebbe's leadership and what was um, interesting. He said, what, what was like the Jewish view of the world and where it goes. And um, so I, we were t I was telling him the idea that each person has a mission. Every person is the Rebbe's main, main mission to the world was the world isn't a jungle. We tend to, tend to feel that the world is a jungle. Things are random. We'll get to that in a minute. But there is a boss to the world and God is in charge and he puts each of us where we are as in a position because he trusts us with that. And that's what he was, that basically was the discussion there. Thank you. Okay. Um, if we want to uh, move on to the next part, unless you want to have another question. No, let's move yeah? on. Okay, we'll move, move on. Okay, so um, in, in the past few months, obviously, people have asked me, as Rabbi Nacinta, people around the world are, are facing and asking, you know, it's challenging in England. Yes, it is, but it's not uniquely challenging. Obviously, we haven't seen the, the, uh, the knock-on effects economically or what's going to happen. And all of us are going to be faced with a challenge of how we persevere over the next few months. And it's not uniquely British thing, something all over the world. And, um, and I think that there is some very important keys that if we follow them, it really will make a big difference. Right before lockdown, or this COVID hit, was the 10th of Shvat, the Yud, Yud Shvat, the 10th day in the month of Shvat, which marks the day that the Rebbe assumed leadership. And I was reading his talks of that time, and what he chose as his theme, as I mentioned just now, the world is not a jungle. So he took a discourse as known as Batilagani, I came to my garden, where Solomon, King Shlomo, is an analogy, creates the garden as an analogy for God's world, as God coming to his garden, this world. Now, this is a very important aspect. Many people, you know, the Rebbe is known for his positive outlook on the world. But that doesn't mean that you don't recognize the challenges. Doesn't mean that you ignore the challenges. That's not what being positive is about. It's not about fooling yourself, anybody else. It's about asking yourself, what is your outlook? Do you view, and ask yourself this question, I'm asking everybody who's watching, do you view the world as a bad place where sometimes good things happen at random? Or do you view the world as a good place inherently where sometimes difficult things happen which we don't understand? Is it a good, bad place where good things happen at random by mistake? Or is it really a good place? Is the canvas upon which this world exists, is it good and the some things are challenging? Now it's this mindset that the Rebbe is giving to the Jewish people after 1950, right after the Holocaust, remember? And it's this mindset that he's telling us to dip into in order to get into the reservoirs of Jewish resilience. We always bounce back. Why? How do we always bounce back? And he's telling us it's because you have to have the, the, the Basi Lagani mindset. Do you view the world as a jungle where everything is random and nothing's organized, nothing's planned, 
or do you view it as a beautiful garden by every blade of grass um, put there by a landscaper for a purpose? What is your mindset? Do you have the jungle mindset or the garden mindset? When you have a random jungle mindset, then what happens is you become a victim. There's no reason, there's no rhyme or reason, and you're expecting it just to be bad. And what can I do? This happened to me, that happened to me. Oh my, look at all these terrible things. Or if you have the garden mindset, you say there's a landscaper who put everything in its place and I am part of that garden. I am a flower in that garden. I'm a blade of grass in that garden. I was put there for a reason and for a purpose. And there's a, there's a, um, <clears throat> there is a goal and something and a task that I have to do in, in the situation that I find myself. There is a famous um, e expression in, in Yiddish, which people say, which is from the jungle mindset. What's that sign? What's going to be? Oh my, what will be? And we keep asking ourselves that. If you ask yourself that a lot, it may be that you see the jungle mindset. The garden mindset doesn't ask what will be. It asks, what do we do now? You can have two people going through exactly the same experience. They are, imagine these two people. They're out in the elements. They don't have a roof over their head. They don't have access to a bathroom. And they're alone. And actually, one of them's life is in mortal danger. And one of them is a complete and absolute victim, and the other one is at the top of his game. Who are they? One is a homeless person on the street who's had a hard chances in life and has been dealt a hard deck. And the other is a commando in the army, say the Israeli army. He's perched on his own, far away from everybody, on a hill in Lebanon, overlooking a terrorist camp who are about to attack. And he is scouting out and he cannot move and he cannot go anywhere. He can't, I have a friend who did this. He couldn't even go to the bathroom because if the dogs, they would send dogs to, for his scent, they would pick up his hiding place the next day. So both of these people are in very uncomfortable positions. One is a victim and one is a commando, a leader. The, 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 and he's there for a purpose and he's a goal and there's something that's dependent on him. The Bussi Lagani mindset, the garden mindset, takes us out from the jungle of victimhood and puts us into the garden of leadership where we have a task ahead of us. How do we know we have a task ahead of us? Because I'm in the garden and it's a, the garden is planned by an amazing landscaper and I'm part of that garden. He doesn't put me here for no reason. There was a, uh, there was a graffiti in an American uh, on uh, subway, it says, I must be worth something because God don't create no trash. God doesn't put me here for, for no reason. So when we are thinking and when we are caught, we have to figure out our thoughts and our minds always should be, what is my next step? What is the next action that is, de is demanded of me or the world depends on me for? Sometimes that could be, just be taking care of your family, sometimes your business, and sometimes it could be helping someone else. And sometimes at two o'clock in the morning when you can't sleep, your task and your mission is to go to sleep. And that's what's dependent on you. That's point number one. But then how do we find our mission? And in this idea is something which I would like to share, which I would, if we could take away from this, and then we can go on to questions. And this is probably the most important of all. I'm just going to um, share on the screen another slide. The, I, was, I, I look at COVID as having four branches. There's the physical health, the emotional health, the financial health, and the domestic health. The physical health is we get physically affected by COVID. We're happy to go to the doctor. We even will tell our friends, I've been hit by it. We'll get a lot of sympathy. We'll get medical care, hopefully, and hopefully we'll recover. Emotional, financial, and domestic health are equally as random almost to people. Yes, just like the physical COVID, if you have underlying conditions or other conditions in your circumstances, you could be more prone to getting it. And the same goes with the emotional, financial, and domestic. And going forward, this may be what, it, what we'd be encountering as well. The problem with the emotional, health, financial, and domestic parts of COVID is that there's a stigma attached to them. We're embarrassed to share, and our friends are embarrassed to share with us. So it's almost invisible and it's hard to, 
to, um, to, um, to help. Now, um, <clears throat> uh, there was a famous Hasidic saying that when you've lost your money, you haven't lost much at all. When you've lost health, you've lost half. But when you've lost your resolve, you've lost it all. Now, many times people who are the ones to, quickest to lose their resolve are not the ones who lose their health, but the ones who lose the money. So that's number one. Um, first of all, we have to realize that remove the stigma of the other three branches. But finally, everybody has the solution to somebody's, to someone's um, problem. There is someone out there who's problem you have the solution to and it's not because you know it now it's because going back to that blade of grass thing we are blades of grass put in a, in a specific space a specific time that Hashem puts us there King David says in Tehillim Hashem mitzadei kover kananu from God the pathways of man are planned out by God I was walking in the street a few weeks ago doing exercise and I meet a neighbor who told me, we just chatted, we haven't seen each other for a while. She told me that she's a surgeon in a specific hospital. Now I asked her what she does there. She is an ENT surgeon and um, she does the tracheotomies now for COVID patients. This was in the height of it. And we moved on. A week later, I get a call from someone who I don't know so well. Asked me, by the way, do you know who runs the ICU of this and this hospital? The exact hospital? I'm like, no. But then I remembered that I met this doctor. And she's a consultant surgeon at that hospital. So I texted her, do you know the ICU, the head of it? She said, well, uh, it changes as many different departments. Why do you need? I told her, she said, what's the name of the patient? I gave the name and the date of birth. I didn't hear back. A few weeks ago, now this, uh, why did this person need the name of the ICU? Because his father was very ill in the hospital. And the hospital was so overwhelmed, they weren't really communicating with the patient's family, at least senior doctors were not. And uh, he had already changed his name. He was on ventilation. It was really, really bad. And they weren't hearing much. So I told her and she said she will get them to ask. And uh, I didn't hear back. And then I hear this man has come home dancing with music into his house in completely returned back from health. So I sent the, a video clip of this man dancing literally into his house. Well, majorly dancing, but you know, holding on to someone with a hot solar, but he in good health. And she told me that she actually did uh, in the end check out, check him out and ask for him. I don't know whether that made a difference or not, but what I do know is that I never planned this. It was Hashem planning it for us. And the only thing is, if we're going to get through the next few months, we have to open ourselves up to others and see what they may be struggling with and keep our mind focused on maybe we know someone who can help somebody else. As the Rebbe said when he gave out, the reason why he gave out dollars is that when two people meet, something good can happen for a third. You might be meeting someone tomorrow that may not be such a meaningful meeting for you, but if you keep your eyes open, that might lead to the solution for somebody else. Wishing everybody health in all four areas of COVID, good health, good finances, good emotional health, good shalom bias, and most of all, Good spiritual health. Thank you very much. Steve, one question from you. Can't hear you. You're muted, Steve. Apologies there. First, <clears throat> firstly, we've got a question, Bensi, from Frank. Is there yeah. an increased interest in British jury in making Aliyah? There has been uh, for a while British jury making Aliyah. Um, the, uh, I'm not sure though how much of it is about running away from something or running to something. Many times we, we take these numbers of Aliyah as indicating something else. We have to be careful of how we interpret those numbers. I think most of the people who want to make Aliyah are not running away, but they're running towards something. Mm. The final question from you. Uh, yes. Um, Bensi, you've got, we saw in the introductory video, there's some amazing work being done to date. Can you share with us any projects that you're currently working on or projects that you're planning um, uh, uh, for the remainder of the year? 
Okay, so there are so we are working on a, a few exciting projects for uh, Rosh Hashanah, but it's a little bit hard to completely um, know what the circumstances will be. But part of the philosophy that we want to take, especially during COVID, is we want Yiddishkeit is about empowering each Jew. And you, you, Judaism really was always a home-based religion. Um, and each Jew can own their Judaism. It's an inheritance. So now is a chance to do that. And Zoom has been incredible. The amount of people that are learning today, you know, there's never been, we had 750 people at an event. It, 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 it's incredible revolution that's happening in the Torah learning. Yet. But there's another aspect, which is bringing Judaism into people's homes, not just through technology. So we are working on a few projects which we're going to lay out as we did on Shavuot and Pesach, as you saw, bringing it into people's houses. And uh, you know, depending on what's needed, there's shofar in the park, which is to get as many people to at least hear shofar on Rosh Hashanah. If you cannot go to the synagogue, we will enable as many people as possible to hear shofar. And uh, as time gets closer, we will, we will be working on that. And also there is, um, we're trying to also work on helping people in networking when it comes to, um, like I said before, people have need opportunities. There are many people who have certain business ideas that they need help with, etc. Or, and we're trying to work on some uh, to formulate that in a in a stronger way that will help people with their material needs and get people going. But the main thing is again unity and friendship and being there for each other. Yes. That Thank will get us through the next few months. Thanks, Thank you. Vincent. and you certainly uh, have an amazing, as you said it, God in my mindset. And thank you very much for the talk this afternoon. Thank you. Stephen, lovely to see you again. And Rabbi Siddur, thank you for turning the world upside down. <laughs> thank you, you, Rabbi Masinta, a very big, a very big inspiration to all of us around the world. But I must say to you that uh, we all resolve, all the guys listening, participating, and we are looking in this world as a garden. We are changing it from a jungle to a garden. And please God through us all collectively doing that. May Taka be a garden, may we have the revelation of godliness in this world, which will happen with the coming of Mashiach, with the revelation of Mashiach, may he come immediately. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.